Good afternoon and happy Tuesday, everybody. Hope it's treating you well. Uh, first off, I want to apologize for moving this to a different date. Had a bit of a family emergency and um, had, to, had to change the date. I hope we don't ever have to do that again. Let's get started with the quiz. Uh, how many chiropractors does it take to change a light bulb? Answer one, but it'll take 24 visits. I apologize, you didn't pay for the jokes here. Um, let's get off to uh, how much a car member, California Applicants Attorneys member is really worth. Um, applicants Council is gonna say, show me the money, obviously, and we're probably gonna feel the other way. Back in the old days, the pre-SB 899, SB 863, um, those of you who are a bit older like myself will remember that uh, applicants could get large sums of permanent disability based on subjective complaints only. In fact, a complaint of constant severe pain without any objective findings would qualify them for a perm total, cha-ching. Um, there were penalty, penalties on any species could result on a them receiving 10% of the species. So for example, uh, you love, you're late on a temporary disability payment, you would pay them a penalty of 10% of all TD payments. Similarly, if you fail to pay or reimburse for a medical, unreasonably reimburse for a medical procedure, uh, including medicine, um, you could end up paying them 10% of all of the medical care that you provided, cha-ching, um, same, same thing with VR. At one point, VR, we had VR. Prior to that, there was a $16,000 cap. Prior to that, there was no cap. And um, applicants' attorneys could get a significant fee out of that. Cha-ching. Well, those are all gone and things have changed. So how to make up the difference? A lot of applicants' attorneys are trying very creative things, one of which is utilizing Labor Code Section 5710. Obviously, 5710 has been around for a very, very long time. It's been around as long as I've been around anyway. Um, but uh, there's a re, uh, re or new interest in it. So here's the question. How much should you be paying for 5710 fees? Well, what does 5710 say? It says that an injured employee or a dependent, if their deposition is called to be taken, shall receive um, attorney's fees in a reasonable amount. And it's within the discretion of the WCAB to determine that amount. Well, that provides us with absolutely no information whatsoever. What's reasonable to you is probably going to differ from what's reasonable to me, and I most guarantee, even if we agree, the applicant's counsel is just gonna disagree with us. So what's reasonable, what does it mean? I think Kaw disagrees. Um, be careful. Virtually every WCAB district office has what they call an attorney fee guideline and recommendation. It's created by the local applicant's attorneys who act positively have absolutely one thing in common and it's not your interest. Uh, defense attorneys who don't represent you and judges who are based in this on generalities and are probably leaning towards making sure that the benefits go to the applicant and therefore that a generous uh, uh, 5710 fee go to their representative. So the attorney fee guideline may be a good start, but it's nothing more. Uh, the amount will likely be, the amount listed will likely be allowed if applicants attorney requests it and the defense doesn't object, which means we're falling asleep at the wheel and something we should not be doing. Which boards is there an attorney fee guideline? Well, most of them. And you can actually, uh, there's says one in Sacramento, San Francisco, et cetera, et cetera. You wanna get a hold of one, you probably want to uh, go to the uh, WCAB district office to get yours. You can get a couple on Google, and as a matter of fact, just before this presentation, I Googled it, and I could only find one, and it was awfully old. Um, this uh, text is, or this uh, uh, web, uh, web uh, this uh, presentation is a little old, and uh, I'm gonna slide. I couldn't find the San Francisco one, I could only find the Salinas one. Um, so you don't wanna be Googling for it, even though you think you can find anything on Google, apparently it's not always true. You need to go to the WCAB district office to get the local attorney fee guideline or have your attorney or hearing rep do that for you. So fresh out of law school, applicants attorneys are claiming $300 an hour or more. I know that I certainly am not earning that rate. I presume you aren't either. I'm a bit jealous. Specialists um, get even more, significantly more, in some cases even double what the newbies are getting. Who's a specialist? Somebody who's been working, doing workers' compensation in a substantial uh, way for the last five years or more, who've been involved in 100 non-doctor depots, in other words, just sat through them in large part, um, or PTCs or petitions.
petitions for removal, uh, 20 trial, five recons and or answers to recons and or district court of appeal petitions or answers to same, 10 Dr. Crossack plus continuing, edu continuing education, um, um, attorneys uh, generally are required to have 36 hours of continuing education every three years. Um, there are increased requirements for special attorneys who are specialists. By the way, you can't list yourself as a specialist in any area of law unless, you've been, unless you have been certified by the state bar. Anyhow, long story short, these uh, specialists will ask for significantly greater 5710 fees. So how much experience does your applicant's attorney have, or at least the one that's pounding down your door for more money? Well, first off, we just ask them. But number two, and you can also look it up on the Cal Bar um, attorney search. If you've not gone on the California Bar website and done the attorney search, I think you uh, might have fun. Look up your favorite or least favorite attorney. Um, I looked up one of my least favorite, whoops, I looked up one of my least favorite here. Um, it says, the only early information here, it says that he's old and that he went to the University of Michigan. And so he's very happy because Michigan beat Notre Dame this weekend. Now, I think uh, <clears throat> college football is far more interesting than, than workers' compensation. So I wanted to bring that up. If you disagree by that, what, by the way, I mean, I think you really need to reassess your priorities and um, start having more fun outside of the office. So these uh, attorney fee guidelines and recommendations, what kind of quote unquote evidence are they? And how does applicant's attorney use them um, to argue for greater uh, amounts of uh, 57, greater uh, 57, 57 10 fee awards? The answer is, this is a trick question. Actually, they aren't evidence. And um, this is great language that was provided in a report and recommendation in a case that um, um, was adopted by the WCAB when denying reconsideration. Um, Dr. Or Judge Dennis Fact said the following, the exhibits are not only inappropriate under the labor code, but they're irrelevant, immaterial, and inadmissible hearsay. They haven't been adopted by the administrative director, so it's up to the judge to decide what's reasonable and what's not reasonable. Um, these uh, guidelines don't do the trick. So irrelevant, immaterial, inadmissible hearsay, mere opinion. I like that language. And if applicant's counsel is arguing for more 5710 fee or greater 5710 fee than you, you believe is appropriate and it's worth the argument, um, this, is, this is a wonderful language to rely upon. So where does that leave us? Well, the upshot is don't believe the guidelines and recommendations, but don't ignore them either because they are going to be used as a rough guideline by applicant or by, by the judge. Other concerns or considerations, uh, WCAB Commissioner uh, and prior chairwoman Kaplan said that uh, some of the considerations to be included are the attorney's time, obviously, their effort, care, experience, skill, the complexity of the issue at hand. Um, the length of a, the length in when this when we're dealing with a uh, recon or writ, the number of pages involved, the number of cases cited, and where the issues are novel, and I think this is going to be true both in the recons, the writ, and in the deposition themselves. Um, is this a standard low back claim, or does this involve um, whether there's an independent contractor versus an employee? And how and does AB5, for example, um, apply? So effort and care uh, at deposition, did applicants counsel properly object to the questions? Or did they review their file during the deposition? Or read a newspaper? I've seen this happen. Were they reading emails while the deposition went forth and just ignore as the defense asked the questions? Or worst of all, Worst of all, did they fall asleep? You might think that's ridiculous. That would never happen. Um, I'm here to say that in my very first workers' compensation deposition, oh so very long ago, um, that's exactly what happened. I noticed that applicant's counsel was snoring. Now, I had just fresh, was well, a fresh law student, just had gotten out of law school at UCLA, and they hadn't prepared me for this. I didn't know what the heck to do. So I did the one thing, the only thing that I could think to do. I whispered. Didn't want to interrupt the uh, sleeping dog, and we proceeded to conclude the deposition. I think all rights were uh, restored. Harvey, skills and results. Read the transcripts for insight. Complexity of issues, 
we've already discussed that. It does make a difference. 50, 5801, um, when denying a writ of review that's filed by the defendant, the DCA and the DCA, this Court of Appeal says um, the defendant's move was frivolous or without merit. Um, applicant's counsel is, again, entitled to a quote-unquote reasonable attorney fee for their answer. Um, we've got evidence that says the fees of $300 are for, uh, appropriate for unquestioned experience, $250 for a two-year attorney who's not a certified specialist. Now, this is 2010, so the numbers have obviously gone up, but I want you to realize, I want you to have some understanding of uh, the bases or where they're coming from. Okay, so we've got a reasonable rate, and we've picked that one out. What do we need? We need another multiplier. We need to know how long the, the deposition took. What was the start and stop time? And we can get this from the transcript, but if we're waiting for the transcript, we can also get that from the hearing report. Hopefully your attorney is providing that information in the hearing report at the very beginning of that report. And oftentimes we'll receive a bill from applicants counsel that'll include um, a portion for reviewing the file. Absolutely positively not. They're not entitled to uh, a fee for reviewing the file. Prep time, they will always charge for prep time. Are they entitled to that? Yes and no, it has to be reasonable. So in the deposition, your attorney should be asking the applicant under oath, how long did the preparation, your preparation time go with, uh, how long were you prepped by your attorney? I can't tell you how many times I've heard the applicant say 10 minutes and applicant counsel interrupt and say, no, 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 that was wrong, it was 45 minutes. Um, that always makes for an interesting conversation. So 30 minutes, I think any judge in the state will find that to be reasonable, and it's certainly okay if the applicant confirms it under oath. 60 minutes, now we're trying to, now we're pushing it a little bit. If the applicant confirms it under oath, and if we've got a complicated or sophisticated issue at hand, then it's, we're going to buy it. Anything longer, um, they've got some serious explaining to do. Travel time. Yes, applicant's attorney is entitled to travel time. That's one of the reasons we know, typically have the deposition at applicant's attorney's offices. Um, it's much cheaper to send a defense attorney at their lower rate than to have applicant's counsel charge us at their $600 an hour rate to just uh, drive across town. Um, but remember, it's only for a reasonable rate. So if, for example, applicant's counsel is based in Stockton and the deposition pr proceeds in Sacramento, which is about a one hour each way, that will probably be deemed to be reasonable. But what if applicant's counsel is based in Los Angeles, the applicant is injured and lives in San Francisco? Not so clear. They're going to have to explain why this is reasonable for them to be flying up and down the state to, to represent an applicant in San Francisco. Are they going to ask, they're going to have to ask why this applicant's attorney, aren't there any qualified applicant's attorneys um, closer to the appropriate venue? Uh, judges are not going to smile too greatly on, on this, this type of situation. All right, so we've got the 57 10 feet order. We want to review it and object timely, if at all appropriate. When do we, we, do, when do we need to uh, object? The order will tell us when to object. So what do we do? We consider the attorney fee guideline. We determine whether the jury meets the requirements. Are they billing at a higher or lower at the same rate as required, recommended by the attorney fee guideline? What is their experience, particularly years of uh, experience in workers' compensation? What do they tell us when we ask them at deposition? What does it tell us when we look at the California Bar website? Are they a specialist? That too will be provided by the California Bar website. What kind of F, quote unquote effort and quote unquote care was were shown? What kind of skill and results were demonstrated? And what was the complexity of the issues? Have you ever had a defense attorney stipulate to a particular rate at deposition? Big heck no. We, we don't know what's going to happen. I, I never stipulate to anything of that sort at deposition. There have been times that applicant's counsel has refused or indicated that they would refuse to allow the deposition to proceed unless until it was agreed that certain uh, parameters of the 5710 fees would be allowed. 99% um, of the time, I'll... Uh, uh, I'll fight this tooth and nail. Sometimes it's not worth it, but if they do want to proceed that way and we want to fight, I'll, we certainly file for sanctions, and I think we get them in that situation. Now, is it worth the fight? We've spent a lot of time on 5710 fees, and oftentimes it's not. 
Um, oftentimes we're talking about a very small differential, 25, 50, 100 bucks, 200 bucks. But sometimes we want to, uh, sometimes it is worth it, different, the difference, and sometimes we're trying to draw a line in the sand. So it's time to do a little math. We have to consider the amount of the overcharge, consider the cost of the objective, or, or objection, that too is not going to be for free. A relationship with applicants council, and whether or not we want to use this as a bargaining chip, will it will it be effective? Attorney fees for deposition, what if the applicant doesn't sign the transcript? It doesn't matter, we still have to pay for that deposition. What if there's a finding of no AOE, COE? There was no injury um, at work, or, or there was a complete defense, they weren't an employee, they were an independent contractor, or some such. Why should an, an applicant receive 5710 fees? Well, they're an applicant. The, the 5710 fee says for applicants, it doesn't say for employees. So we pay in that situation as well. What about if there's fraud, the demonstrable fraud? Well, maybe we pay, maybe we, we, we don't. The Mitchell case held that it would be a due process violation to order an attorney fee be paid without the giving, giving the defense an opportunity to be heard um, about, uh, we heard there are given the opportunity for the defense to show their argument that fraud uh, is being alleged and it actually is at, occurred. So um, the fees are going to be deferred until the fraud issue is fully resolved. It's kind of like uh, medical legal um, objections. Those of you in Southern California know all about those. Those of you in Northern California hopefully are, um, have not had to go down that, that path. Depositions. We're continuing a little bit more. The CCP, the California Code of Civil Procedure, states an adverse party may use for any purpose the deposition of a party to the action. It is not ground for objection to the use of that deposition of a party by an adverse party that the opponent is available to testify, has to testify, or will testify at trial or another hearing. Does this apply to workers' compensation? Remember, the CCP is. Um, sort of a recommendation or um, framework upon which workers' compensation can rely, but it's not mandated. So the answer is it's not clear in this case. Uh, we did have a case in which the WCAB refused admission of applicants for transcript um, because the offering party failed to show that it had exercised reasonable diligence to procure the applicant, uh, or the witnesses rather, attendance at trial. Um, the WCAB would prefer to hear the witness um, over, there's a preference for hearing the witness at trial um, um, so that the judge can take a look at the witness, um, assess their credibility, um, that that is favored over the, uh, over the transcript in such in some situations. That is absolutely not true with regards to doctors um, for medical issues, and it's not true to voc rehab uh, vendors um, anymore either. At this point, there has to be a substantially strong reason to have, have them brought in uh, to the WCAB for testimony. In fact, that's statutorily mandated. So there are cases going the other way. Uh, in this particular case, the applicant was not listed um, as a witness at the MSC, and the judge excluded the tra transcript, even though it was listed by both parties at the MSC. Um, it was held, nevertheless, that the testimony of the injured worker was admissible. They said, this is because, with, given the, tra the transcripts were listed, they couldn't claim surprise or prejudice when it was offered into evidence. Transcript ad transcripts are admissible whether the applicant is listed, available to testify, or was subpoenaed to trial. So, transcripts. Why are transcripts admitted? Aren't they hearsay? Well, what's hearsay? Hearsay is an out-of-court statement offered to prove the truth of the statement. Boy, that just rolls off my tongue from law school. That's one of those things you hear a thousand times in law school. And then you get to learn all the exceptions to the rule of hearsay. And the, the exceptions are longer than your arm. I think I learned them for the final exam and immediately forgot about those. But back to the, the uh, main point, these out-of-court statements offered to prove the true truth of the statement, isn't it better to have the judge be able to evaluate the applicant or the witness um, um, face to face. Why admit this hearsay? Well, first off, the CCP is not mandatory in workers' compensation, as we discussed earlier. And the judge may admit evidence that is, quote, best calculated to ascertain the substantial rights of the parties. 
that's code for the judge thinks the judge knows what's going on and can ascertain themselves um, whether or not they're being bamboozled um, by way of a transcript. Um, when in, we got another case in which the witness uh, was listed by both parties. The employer objected to this transcript, nevertheless, um, and the, arguing that the injured worker had showed no effort to have the witness appear at trial. Nevertheless, the testimony was admitted. I strike that the transcript was admitted. The, testi the uh, testimony need was needed for uh, a serious and willful claim, and they said they needed the transcript to quote unquote develop the record. And once again, the argument that they were not bound by the CCP. Um, you're going to find that a lot. You're going to find the argument for allowing them information that might otherwise um, be excluded. The uh, arguments in favor of that develop the record. We're not bound by the CCP, and the judges making inquiries that are, quote, best calculated to ascertain the substantial rights of the parties. These are the three arguments you're going to hear thrown up against you on a regular basis. The Morales case, a Marit denied matter. There was a transcript of the applicant that was taken by a third party, but was a photocopy, not the original, not certified. The judge took a look at the transcript and said there was no employment. And the question here was, is a photocopy, an uncertified, um, not original photocopy um, admissible? And the answer was yes, not a problem. The applicant was represented during the deposition. If they had any problems their attorney, with the deposition, the transcript, their attorney could have uh, was at the deposition to make objections, was there to review or had the opportunity to review the depos deposition transcript with the, uh, with the uh, witness. Um, no surprise, no problem. The Collins case. In this case, we took a step outside of the workers' compensation venue, and there were transcripts taken in the applicant's civil claim. It was held that nevertheless, even though it wasn't part of the workers' compensation proceedings, it was admissible at the WCAB, and in this case, it made a lot of sense to determine the employer's credit, uh, credit right. So long as the party against whom it is offered has a, quote, opportunity to cross-examine the witness before the judge, everything's groovy. What if you're naughty at the deposition? There's lots of ways of being naughty at the deposition, and this is one of them, lying under oath. Uh, the insurance code says that's a bad thing. It says that's fraud, making a knowingly false or fraudulent material statement at the deposition when you've been sworn in. Um, we've also got the penal code, which does something different. Now remember, the insurance code, code here, 1874.4, deals with fraud. But we deal with perjury as well. If you've taken the oath and you say something that you knowingly be defaults, you're guilty of perjury. Um, however, for perjury, the applicant needs to sign and deliver the transcript. That's not needed for fraud, which is why they're often alleged, um, both alleged, and oftentimes fraud is successful where perjury is not. But, but there is another option, if the, uh, or an additional option. If the transcript is not signed, we can also go for attempted fraud. Transcript not signed, it's still admissible. Here's a fun fact. Let's say the applicant makes the material false statement, <coughs> excuse me, at the deposition. That is grounds to toss their behind out of their job. What if there has been a misrepresentation or two at the deposition? Then the applicant thinks about thinks about and says, you know what? I'm sorry, I lied. I want to come clean. It was held that that there is no penalty in that particular case, and the reason was um, the applicant um, admitted the truth before um, it was uh, in time for the uh, to allow the empl uh, the employer to investigate the post admission evidence. Uh, I think uh, if the applicant had lied la later after the employer had come up with the uh, damning evidence, we would have had a different um, different. Uh, uh, ending there. All right, lights, camera, action, get ready to videotape. Can we videotape? Do we have the right to videotape? Sure, we have the right to videotape. What we do with the videotape and where we videotape are two different questions, and um, we can also come up with different answers to each of the questions. 
So absolutely, maybe. The McIntyre case. Applicant appeared at deposition but refused to be videotaped. Applicants count, or the defense rather, obtained, filed a petition to compel, relying on the CCP, which says, Code of Civil Procedure, which says, thou shalt be videotaped if you're notified you're going to be videotaped. Um, the WCAB said, no, we're not going to compel this. The reason was, they said the CCP is not applicable. Remember, I said a little while ago, they're going to bring that up all the time. And the employer must show good cause. In which the defense failed to show irreparable harm that it would suffer as a result of not being allowed to proceed with this um, deposition filming. Now, this was in 1999. Um, strike that when we talk about this. If videotaping were common, the right to, quote, exp expeditious and unencumbered proceeds uh, pr um, procedures would be defeated. Um, first off, where does that language, expeditious and unencumbered, come from? That comes from your California Constitution, which says that, that that's the kind of workers' compensation um, system we're going to have, one that is expeditious and unencumbered. And um, so, nonetheless, in McIntyre, was suggested that videotaping would cause a violation of that. You wouldn't be able to have an expeditious deposition. It wouldn't be unencumbered um, if filming took place. Do you believe that? Is there any reason to think that the filming would delay things? Um, I don't think so, and we've got another case that underscores that. Things got a little bit better with the Reed case. It said, the notice said, we're going to videotape and audio tape. That you, you can notice the deposition and say, we're going to videotape and audio tape, or we may videotape and audio tape um, without actually proceeding um, with that. I recommend when noticing a deposition that that language always be included in case you eventually will change your mind and do want to so proceed. In this case, just like the prior case, applicant refused, said there's no good cause shown to take my video. And the judge, nevertheless, ordered attendance at the videotape depot. Um, and it, uh, the applicant's attorney filed a petition for removal, and it was denied. In this case, they said, you know what? 5710 actually says we're following the CCP. Deposition 50, or Labor Code Section 5710A says depots quote, to be taken in a manner prescribed by law for like depositions and civil actions. So this is great act language. Um, not only is the Reed case great to be cited, but um, the, the statute itself is directly on point. I think we have stronger and stronger arguments to videotape. I think uh, the fact that everybody and their brother is videotaping every day um, makes it um, what makes the WCA more, more comfortable with it as well. Think about it. We all carry a cell phone that has wonderful cameras and videotape, um, videotaping capability. Um, you know, in the past years ago, the, 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 these uh, video taping services were, were kind of a pain in the neck. You had to get the right, color, um, um, the right uh, lighting. You had to get two or three people to operate the equipment. Now it's not, now it's not so, so difficult. Um, continuing with the Reed decision, they cited the CCP, quote, the party noticing the deposition may also um, record the testimony by audio or video technology if the notice of the dep deposition stated an intention also to record the testimony by either of those methods. So that just goes back to my earlier recommendation that you always include that um, intention uh, in the notice of the deposition. Good cause, quote unquote, that language that was used in the prior case to deny the defense the right to, uh, to videotape the deposition is not required by 5710, is not required by the CCP. In fact, the judge was just sort of making it up out of whole cloth. When we face this type of situation, we need to be ready to make that argument. Um, the Reed case also noted that videotape makes, quote, a record of the description of the event that can't possibly be made by a mere court reporter. Think about it. Um, we catch nonverbal responses, we catch gestures, we can catch the demeanor. Um, all of these things can be caught by film that would not otherwise, otherwise be reflected in the deposition transcript. And finally, applicants showed no improper motive um, from the employer. Was, the, was there evidence of unwarranted annoyance, embarrassment, or oppression, or significant harm or prejudice? None of that was shown. Now, we had one case uh, a couple of uh, webinars ago 
in which we ran across it, that's just such a situation, although it was in videotape, we had an employer who was accused of sexual harassment and the uh, employer wanted a representative at the deposition and they selected the person who was the alleged harasser. At that point in time, the WCIB said, no, 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 no. That's going to cause unwarranted annoyance, embarrassment, or oppression. You can send in an employer representative who's not an alleged harasser. Um, so this um, this type of language can be used against us, um, but not in this particular case. And finally, there was nothing that suggested the videotape would take longer than a regular deposition, a point we made earlier. Now that we're all used to videotaping, our children are used to videotaping, um, there's no reason to think that that will extend the length of the deposition or any of the discovery process itself. So what's the rule? Who knows? Neither case is binding, but I think the, the stronger arguments are in favor of allowing the videotaping. Here's a strange little twist, however. It wasn't the applicant here who uh, um, was being videotaped. Appl applicant's counsel was kind of a pain in the neck at the first deposition. And the employer said, you know what? We have deposition two coming up, and we think he was going to be, quote, unnecessarily hostile, offensive, and obstructive. Kind of describes some of my favorite applicants' attorneys. They asked that the judge deposition be held before a judge. Um, that's an option, but judges are not in favor of this. It takes a, a big chunk out of their day, so that's certainly understandable. The judge said, no, 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 just aim the camera at applicants' counsel. Don't aim it at the applicant. You haven't demonstrated. Uh, that that's necessary. In fact, you haven't even asked for it. Aim it at applicant's counsel, and that could, should keep him uh, a little bit better behaved. So that saves WCAB resources, and it's certainly no prejudice to the applicant. They're not even on the video. The Rodriguez case, applicant refused to participate in the medical legal examination unless they could record with the phone. Um, and it was held that that's not an unreasonable refusal. In fact, the CCP provides that the attorney um, can do that is permitted to attend and observe a physical examination and record it in any way that they want to. If the attorney can do it, then certainly the applicant or the injured, allegedly injured worker can do that as well. Like I said, um, the attorney is entitled to do that, but don't expect to see many court reporters down with, uh, at medical legal examinations, let alone um, attorney, applicant's attorney showing up for the medical legal examination. Can you guess why? Well, 57 times. 10 does not provide for uh, reimbursement for the cost of a court reporter um, or reimbursement for the applicant attorney's time at a medical legal examination. It's going to be the employer or the employee rather and the applicant's attorney who bear the cost of that. So uh, far more likely that applicant's attorney is going to give the applicant a um, tape record and say, here, tape record, the tape record your examination. The big problem with, that, with tape recording uh, um, not deposition, recording the medical legal, medical legal examination or the PTP examination. The big problem with that is usually from the doctor, it's the doctor that refuses um, um, to allow re a recording and that causes just another big headache. It's something that we could probably spend 45 minutes talking about. So you suspected that the applicant is lying in deposition and has lied to the doctors and or is malingering and or is exaggerating or all the above, or has undeclared employment, obviously it's time to film. How do we get this to be admissible? It's usually admissible. It's uses, it's proof fraud, ascertaining, ascertaining extent of disability. Now, I said it's usually admissible. Actually, it's usually admissible if we handle it the correct way. Now we have to determine exactly how or what that correct way is. Show the films. You've just given applicants to the judge work. Remember that. They're not necessarily excited about it. He or she must summarize it in the minutes of hearing, in the summary of evidence. So there's definitely a prejudice. If there's a prejudice, at least at this point, in terms of giving the judge extra work, there's a prejudice against having the films entered in. Um, you, may, you may hear applicants turn to say, well, wait a minute. You have violated my, my uh, client's constitutional right to privacy by aiming a camera at them when they did not know what was happening. And the answer is no right, uh, no California constitutional right, no right in the US Constitution is an absolute right. There are exceptions. And in this particular case, there's no reasonable expectation of privacy for conditions that are placed at issue in litigation. 
at least there are, there are no expectations of privacy in certain scenarios um, when they're in their home with all the with all the drapes uh, pulled. There's a reasonable expectation of privacy there, even if they are in the midst of like, litigation um, and something could be filmed that might undercut their claim. But when they're in the public eye, uh, there is no reasonable expectation of privacy. The point, the right of privacy does usually does not exist in a way that will prevent the taking of depot or prevent, uh, prevent of taking it does not exist in a way that would prevent taking the video or prevent the sharing with the doctors. All right, we've got another case in which the applicant was filmed in a parking lot. Makes this, uh, the fact pattern twist the thing slightly. Uh, and then in a grocery store, and the employer wants the doctor to review the parking lot video. However, the employee points out to the sign, it says um, at the parking lot, invitees and guests only no trespassing. The argument is obviously the uh, private investigator was not an invitee and was not a guest. They were there doing a job. They also point out that there was a sign that said private property, which you would arguably the private investigator was violating. Inside the store, there was also a sign, no videotaping, photography, audio taping anywhere on the store's uh, premises without prior consent. Well, the, the uh, a uh, private investigator did not obtain that prior consent. So the question was, is this a right, uh, was there a violation of the applicant's right to privacy? Um, and that will determine whether or not the film was admissible. At least it's gonna be the first step in determining whether it's admissible. It was held, nope, no violation of privacy. The film is not admissible because there's no code prohibiting uh, uh, first, uh, private investigators from shooting film in violation of a post, uh, posted private property owners. Um, there is the anti-paparazzi statute, um, which says you can't chase down and harass people, typically famous people, um, um, uh, filming them and videotaping them. Um, but there is an express exception to that, and that is situations where the subject of the inquiry is suspected of fraud. Um, where there is no re there is no reasonable expectation of privacy, also where the activities are conducted in the open and accessible in, in an accessible area within the sight and hearing of the general public and customers or visitors um, uh, to that open and accessible space. Now, I, I mentioned uh, a, a, a situation in which the applicant is in a home with all the with the doors closed and the uh, drapes drawn. I um, actually have seen cases in which they didn't draw the drapes and video was taken of them from outside, the camera pointed inside through the, through the, uh, the window, and that was held to be admissible. So they're gonna have to be fairly well hidden uh, to successfully argue an invasion of privacy claim. Um, it was further noted in this particular case that the location signs were for business, not for the employee. And so we got a balancing test. We need to balance, and this is true of all constitutional issues, uh, such as right to privacy. You've got to um, balance the right to privacy with the important um, um, objective of preventing workers' compensation fraud. Uh, in other words, we have the value, the weight of the film determined is, is, is determined exclusively by the WCAB. And the film's important. It can be used to find a lack of credibility, to find that the injury is not as the applicant claims, that the applicant's actually able to return to work when they claim they're not. However, if the film's too short, if it's irrelevant, or it's inconsistent with the applicant's claims and testimony, um, the employee may be unconvicted, found to be unconvicted, un un unimpeached. Credibility impeachment. Does that mean we have a take nothing? Let's say the judge, we do get the film in, and the judge says, I think this guy's a liar. I don't, wouldn't trust him to tell me the right time of day. Does that mean we get to take nothing? And the answer is unfortunately no. Um, we've got cases in which the judge has taken a look at objective evidence such as surgical reports to make a re award. Um, I think that's more true. Uh, subject uh, post 1105 when we started using the AMA guides um, because to a large extent the um, permanent or impairment um, can be assessed without uh, any subjective complaints by the applicant. 
the judge says, okay, we've got a total meniscus tear and repair, or, um, or the uh, doctor says that, they get X amount of impairment. Uh, it doesn't matter that they're limping less than they claim, uh, limp, they're limp, in reality, they're limping less than what they claim to the doctor they are. All right, so what if the doctor reviews the video? Now what happens? There's some options. When we're looking for video uh, that, are in, shows, that is inconsistent with the subjective complaint, they alter uh, opinion regarding the disability, and make, or they may maintain their original opinion. Oh, and what if two or more doctors come up with different conclusions with the film? So one doctor says, yeah, that film really changed my mind. Another doctor, the PTP ortho, the medical legal ortho says, no, that didn't change my mind one bit. Now, actually, that's going to be up for the judge. There's going to have to determine which report is more substantial evidence. So in that situation, the judge is probably going to want to review those films. Um, what if it, there are films of significance, um, and the judge says, takes a look at them, says, yeah, I think this is substantial evidence. This is important. But the uh, doctor has not been, the, the films have not been submitted to the doctor. Can he, the doctor's reports nevertheless be considered substantial evidence? And the, the answer was yes, um, but only if the judge rules the film was not inconsistent with the doctor's report. And the judge has the alternative in that type of situation to assign a quote unquote regular doctor pursuant to labor code section 5701. Um, remember the term independent medical examiner? Um, that term no longer exists. It's been replaced with regular doctor, which is the same kind of thing. All right, getting the films into evidence, that's not automatic. It must be authenticated. And normally that's done by having the private investigator testify that what he saw or what she saw is what is in, found in the film. The, the rule is such, quote, surveillance films are not ordinarily admitted unless the operator of the movie camera testifies concerning the manner in which the applicant was observed and relates the technical data pertaining to the taking of the movies. They got to explain how they got them. Um, and it, we really want to make sure you can get a hold of the uh, investigator and that they've not been fired or hired somewhere else. Um, usually a, a good private investigator agency will get the forwarding address for somebody who leaves their, their, their employee. The private investigator must testify to the circumstances surrounding the film, that the evidence accurately depicts their observations, and must provide foundational facts. Great legal term. Um, sometimes they don't have those foundational facts and that can cause a problem for the defense. In this one case, the private investigator didn't know the filming dates and then tried to give some estimate that made absolutely no sense. In that situation, the film was held in, held in inadmissible for lack of, prop, lack of proper foundation. What about the fruit of the poisonous tree? This actually is a term that comes from the U.S. Constitution, the U.S. Uh, Supreme Court, but it's not, if you're familiar with that term in that particular case, that's not what I'm talking about here. Um, we're talking about here about film that's not been authenticated, but nevertheless, the medical uh, report relies on that film. What does that mean? It means the report, report is inadmissible. So we could do a lot of damage to ourselves by um, using unauthent unauthenticated film. The Broadway case, he had an AME who said, nope, this guy is unable to compete in the open labor market. Then there was the Sub Rosa, which suggest, suggested quite to the contrary. Um, the, uh, the AME said, no, these films of the quote unquote depicted individual show that he is significantly less, uh, less disabled. But for some reason, the defense fell asleep at the wheel and didn't list the films at the MSC and the films were not offered into evidence. And the question was, well, can we wait around and go get a supplemental from the AME? And the answer was no big surprise, no. When the defense falls asleep at the, at the wheel, the defense falls asleep at the wheel. They should have done what? They should have uh, gotten the video authenticated, they should have listed the investigator as a witness, and they should have listed the films at the MSC. And then they should have brought the investigator in to testify. So we need to know the rules. Employer may have a doctor review sub rosa without authenticating it via an evidentiary, via an evidentiary hearing, but you don't want to rely on that. Um, 
the accuracy and authenticity issues should be addressed in the discovery process, not at the hearing, because hearings can go sideways. For example, your investigator might not show up. Um, the mandatory authentication process before admission to trial does not apply to the doctor. The judge has the discretion uh, regarding non-medical imposition information um, and what, it go, what goes to the doctor. If, uh, if the applicant has an opportunity to pose the doctor and cross-examine the, uh, the um, uh, private investigator at trial, the judge is far more likely to allow the uh, video into evidence um, by finding that there is, quote, no significant prejudice or irreparable repair, um, harm. Um, give them a, that's one of the advantages to providing the film um, after the after the applicant's deposition, something we're um, but before the MSC, something we're going to discuss in um, further detail in a couple minutes. All right, the employee. What about it when the employee is not clearly depicted on the film? The judge can review, do their own review, and the applicant's testimony, and come up with their own determination. As was done in this case, the applicant testified, "Hey, that's not me." The judge said, "It's you, without a doubt." and the film was authenticated and, and, and thus admitted. Now, we talked about lazy defense attorneys. In case, this case, we also had another one. Um, uh, in this case, the judge excluded the sub Rosa because the DA hadn't reviewed the film. Can you guess why? The, judge, the, the DA couldn't possibly um, represent that the film was uh, legit without having reviewed it. And I can, can imagine the judge rolling his or her eyes going, okay, you you didn't review it, but you want me to review it? Uh, tough, tough cookies, that's not gonna happen. Some tips, definitely wanna get multiple days of the um, of film. Um, avoid the, oh yeah, I know when you got that film. I was re doing really well that day, but the next day after pushing it so hard, I was terrible. I was laid up and I couldn't get out of bed. Boy, that's standard issue testimony to uh, uh, one day of film. Um, use one private investigator. Um, sometimes you have to use two or three, but the best bet is to use only one because then you don't have to bring in multiple um, investigators to testify to authenticate the film. Speaking of bringing in the per, uh, private investigators, subpoena them. Subpoena any witness that you ever intend to bring in, uh, in particular, um, but, not, but, but not exclusively, the private investigator, um, and also a, get a confirm written confirmation from them that they know when, where, and how they're supposed to show up. Um, you might say, well, why do I need to uh, uh, subpoena them? Uh, we know that they need to be there. They know that they need to be there. They're not a hostile witness or anything. Uh, the problem is if they get in an auto accident or something else keeps them from coming to the trial that day, the judge is going to ask, did you subpoena them? And when you have to say no, the judge is going to say, tough luck. We're proceeding with the trial without that testimony. And suddenly now you've lost your film. If you can say, yes, I've subpoenaed them, the judge will say, okay, we'll kick this over to another day. Filming, don't be naughty. Just ask the California Supreme Court in the Redner decision. This case goes back to 71, but it's well worth knowing. There was an accepted back and a co-worker of the private investigator claiming to be quote unquote Robert Henry became friends with injured worker and invited him out to the ranch. By the way, this is not friends as in Facebook. This is long before Facebook. Um, Robert Henry got his new friend, the applicant drunk, and then invited the uh, new friend, the applicant to go horseback riding at the party and the next day. And guess who was taking films of this from the barn? The employer used it to discontinue TD, to discontinue treatment, and had the doctors review it and said, yep, there's no PD. What was the holding? They said, you've been naughty. Not only is the film not admissible, the reports are not admissible, and you engaged in fraudulent inducement, which is considered bad. The WCIB cannot rely on evidence in which the applicant was deceitfully induced, quote unquote, to perform actions that he or she might not otherwise have. And it's worse. The film was not admissible, the reports weren't admissible, but, but they also faced uh, action for civil fraud, trespass claims. Um, you can't say, well, wait a minute, workers' compensation is the exclusive jurisdiction, it's the exclusive remedy. No, um, fraud and trespass fall outside of the exclusive workers' compensation deal. So you lose the films, 
lose the evidence and find yourself on the wrong side of the V in the uh, um, in the uh, civil suit. When do you share the films? This is probably the most important thing we're going to talk about, and we're starting to run out of time, so I want to get to it real quickly. Um, it's, it is discoverable, so it is to avoid surprises. Fail to disclose it, and you are going to uh, you are going to lose it. The general rule: disclose that MSD. Um, it remains the general rule, but if it's demanded, you got to share it earlier. And any applicant's attorney worth their, worth their salt is demanding film and, and, and listing it as a continuing demand for film um, in their opening letter. I'm sure if you take a look at any file you've got in the opening letter from applicant's counsel, it includes that boilerplate. If it has been, de been demanded, we can provide the video after the deposition, but before the QME or with a, within a quote unquote reasonable time after the deposition. We've got a case in which the applicant made dem demand for the films and despite this demand, the sub rosa was provided five days prior to the MSC. That was deemed not to be a re uh, reasonable uh, frame of time. Why? Because the applicant's, well, applicant's attorney wasn't able to conduct any further discovery um, and uh, determine whether that evidence was good evidence. Another case, Similar, the film was obtained six months prior to the MSD. Applicants Council sent four letters of the continuing demand that I referred to, and the, sub, the film was served one morning at the morning of the MSD, and there was a request for an, uh, let me take the matter off calendar for additional discovery so Applicants Council could really evaluate the film. It was held, no, no, we're not going to talk this thing. That film is again inadmissible. You had six months, they had a reasonable period of time within the last six months to um, um, provide the film, um, and you could have provided it after the deposition. You messed up, it's not going in. Uh, also, language that was included in this case was that an old talk, if this matter had been taken off, a calendar would have been inconsistent with the objective of liberal pre trial discovery. The employer does not always lose in these situations. Um, in uh, this particular case, there was film taken a couple times in November and once in December. It was served five weeks later or 11 days prior to the MSD. And this was found to be admissible because it was found that the, the delay five weeks was not quote unquote significantly, sufficiently significant. And it was closed, disclosed, disclosed prior to the MSD. So, it's, it's, it's a balancing test. How far before the MSD, how long after the films were obtained, how long after the applicant's deposition was taken. You're definitely allowed to take the deposition um, before you release the films. Uh, there are additional problems to watch out for. Not complying with an order to provide, for example, the films at a mutually agreed time, tainting films, editing, um, editing the films, in one case, the applicant, or rather the, edit, the uh, private investigator edited the films from two hours to 25 minutes, trying to be helpful, but um, that tainted the film and they were no longer, was no longer able to use it. Watch out, films can be hurtful to you. Um, we're not allowed to selectively serve films if that raises the judge's suspicions. Um, in this case, the applicant, whether the defense was ordered to serve all the sub rows and daily logs, even though it was post MSD, because the judge said, I think there's more to it. It was held that, well, it was true that the judge could have just excluded the sub rosa. He took a look at the sub rosa and found out, wait a minute, it should be uh, provided to the applicant as well because it could increase their permanent disability. So you shouldn't be burying the films or hiding films that are problematic to our case. We have to release when we serve all the films, we have to serve all the films. So take that deposition first, even if the sub rosa has been demanded, uh, proceed with the deposition and get the, uh, uh, get the dirt on the applicant, let them lie, and then provide the deposition, uh, depo that's right, that, and then provide the films within a, quote, reasonable, end quote, time. I just want to get a couple of things for you before we go, because we're just about over time. All right. One last thing about timing surveillance with medical legal evaluations. Can you hold on to the sub rosa until the medical legal examination and the WCAB goes both ways? 
it's a depos it's a, the it's very clear. You can wait for the deposition of the applicant to be completed before you provide the films, and then you have to provide it within a reasonable time. But what about uh, waiting for a medical legal evaluation? The Speedle decision provided that sub rosa not produced before the QME examination. Um, in this case, the sub rosa was not produced before the PQME evaluation. Uh, the applicant was posed twice and then seen by the QME. And prior to the QME report being received, but uh, prior to the doctor's deposition, the employer revealed the intent to show the films to the doctor. And the question in this case was should the sub rosa be excluded? And it was held, yes, it was excluded from evidence and from the QME's review. And this was because it wasn't revealed sufficiently prior to the MSD. There we go. And the constitutional requirement to accomplish substantial justice in all case, cases expeditiously, inexpensively, and without encumbrance of any character. They don't want to see unnecessary delays. One other statement, I only want to provide this one quote and then I'm going to let you go. Um, it sort of summarizes things. We have to recall that trial by ambush is out of vogue. Much of a party's work product is accessible by others, or accessible by the other. And the timing of the production is driven by the facts and equities. Not producing sub rosa until after the applicant's deposition serves the purpose of testing an applicant's credibility. After that deposition, the sub rosa must be identified and produced if requested. Um, sorry for going over. Uh, we've got quite a number of other slides, but I'll leave it to you to take a look at them. There's even a joke somewhere in there. And um, uh, if you have any questions, by all means, please do email or email Tammy, and I will get that response to you within 48 hours. Thanks so much, and hang on one second for Tammy.